Good evening and welcome. My name is Christina Strassfield and I am the Executive Director of the Southampton Arts Center. We are delighted to once again partner with our dear friends, the Hamptons Observatory, to present a virtual lecture by Dr. Margaret Whiteycamp, Curator and Chair of the Space History Department at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. In this special evening, you'll experience a space historian's tour through the history of space flight and space science fiction, as demonstrated through the Smithsonian's collection of space and science fiction memorabilia. Dr. Whitey Kemp's talk will be based on her new book, Space Crazed, published in 2022, spanning from the 1929 debut of the futuristic Buck Rogers to the present day privatization of space flight. Space Craze celebrates America's endless enthusiasm for space exploration, featuring historical milestones in space exploration, films and TV shows, literature and comic strips, toys and games, and internet communities. Space Craze is a science lover's dream. The book investigates how space flight, both real and imagined, has served as the nexus where contemporary American concerns such as race, gender, sexuality, freedom, and national identity have been explored and redefined. Dr. Whiteycamp serves as chair for the Space History Department at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum and curates the museum's social and cultural history of spaceflight collection of more than 5,000 artifacts. Whiteycamp earned her PhD in history from Cornell University. During her graduate work, she was a Mellon Fellow in the Humanities and spent a year in residence at the NASA headquarters, NASA History Office in Washington, D.C., as the American Historical Association NASA Aerospace History Fellow. Before joining the Smithsonian, Whitey Camp taught in the Women's Studies programs at Hobart and William Smith College. We are so excited to welcome Dr. Whitey Camp. Just to let you know, we are going to be having a Q&A afterwards, but you need to place your questions in the chat, and I will then read the questions uh, for Dr. Whitey Camp. So without further ado, we will begin our program tonight. Thank you and enjoy. Dr. Whitey Camp. Thank you so much. I am um, right now I'm being, I'm going to figure out about getting my video on. Um, or I'm just going to go to straight to slides and we can figure out about, um, let me try that one more time. There we go. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you this evening. And um, without further ado, let me get us right into the heart of things. And if that's working properly, then I just need to figure out, bear with me a second as I figure out where the, all right, very good. Okay. There's always just a second and you have to narrate it. I think one of the things we've all learned from uh, being on all of these calls as a result of the COVID uh, shutdown was that if you're not narrating it, do people even know what you're doing? All right, so thank you so much to the Hamptons Observatory and to the South Hamptons Art Center uh, for the invitation to speak today. I'm really delighted to get a chance to do this. And I thought that I would start with this. This is a trading card from Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Now, Buck Rogers in the 25th century was one of the very first adventure comic strips in American newspapers. The very first was Tarzan of the Apes, uh, based on the Edgar Rice Burroughs character, and that was in January of 1929. Well, so was Buck Rogers, just a little bit later in the month. Although Buck Rogers actually first appeared in August of 1928 as a character in the pulp magazine, Amazing Stories. So these were these inexpensively printed magazines that carried lots of adventure stories. There were detective versions, there were science fiction versions, true crime versions. And in one that was called Amazing Stories, Philip Francis Nolan published a story called Armageddon 2419 AD. And in that he had this character of Anthony Rogers who was knocked unconscious 
and awoke in the 25th century. And what he sees is what you're seeing on this 1936 trading card. He sees the main female character, Wilma Deering, flying by means of her uh, anti-gravity jumping belt in this kind of very athletic pose with the very 1920s style uh, cap on. And she is wearing tights and she is jumping and moving. And we see in this uh, that she's defending herself. And this is almost exactly on this trading card what the very second panel was in the very first strip ever. And that's where the Buck Rogers character sees her. And that does two things. One, um, it establishes that we must be very far in the future if you have a female character who is this active and independent and self-reliant. Um, and it also then set this scene that they are in a future America that has been invaded by the Mongol hordes, which was the term used at the time and very much a part of the anti-Asian sentiment that was um, very baldly and on the face of things uh, in the 1930s. And so this comic strip then comes out of this short story, but there's an important change, which is that rather than Anthony Rogers being drawn into the comic strips, the suggestion from John Dilly, who owns the Dilly Company, and you can see his name in the copyright and the upper left of this trading card, the Dilly Company syndicated things to newspapers. So you used to get a physical paper and it would have comic strips and advice columns and things like that. And those came from companies that syndicated them. So John Dilly thought this would make it a wonderful adventure strip with the change that instead of Anthony Rogers, it should be Buck Rogers to play into the popularity of Westerns at the time. So this is a strip that begins um, in 1930. There is a radio program by 1932, and there's a whole series of toys that begin by 1934. And it really is an important part of the solidifying of the imagination about spaceflight. And it's something that is a really important topic where I work, which is at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. So as Christina said, I'm the chair of the space history department, and I'm one of uh, several dozen curators who work with the collections, most of which are real space vehicles, real aircraft, uh, and also planetary scientists who are working at the museum. Uh, but what I do both at this site and at our second site, the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center out by Dulles Airport, is I work with a bunch of different kind of collection. It is a physically smaller set of um, a set of smaller objects, although large in number. And this is what we call the social and cultural history of spaceflight collection. So I think of these as the things that really complement and round out the stories that are being told by the artifacts that were actually flown and that used in exploration. So I can give you a, just a small sampling of what these kinds of things are. So some of them are very one of a kind. Top left on your screen is a uh, medallion that was created gold with some precious uh, stones set in it. And that was made in celebration of John Glenn's flight in February of 1962 as the first American to orbit the earth. One was given to Mrs. Annie Glenn and one was given to the Smithsonian. So not one of a kind, but two of a kind, but a very rare thing. The same time, we also have memorabilia that's very commonplace. So below that, we have a mission patch. This one is from STS-93, the space shuttle mission on which Eileen Collins became the first female commander of a spaceflight mission. But a mission patch is something that is easily purchased at any sort of a space site that might be handed out if you had an astronaut come and visit your school. This is something that anyone who's a fan of spaceflight might have in their collection. We also have things like box model kits. I have one here from Ravel of a Mercury capsule separating from its launch vehicle. And we keep that as much for the imaginative vision in the box art. We know that that's not a vision that any human person got to have in the early 1960s. This is an artist's conception of what that vehicle working looked like. And it also is a way for us to document that hobby of getting your hands on either aircraft or spacecraft by physically building models. Uh, we also have then a way of remembering big events. So somewhere in between the ultimately rare and the very commonplace, 
things like the Apollo 11 commemorative medallion that's on the far right hand side on top of your screen. I like this one because the artist actually bothered to make the three figures look like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, not just three heads or three helmets. And we also then have pieces that are part of our collection of space science fiction memorabilia. Things from Star Wars, things from Star Trek, things from Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, uh, through to pieces like The Expanse or Halo. So my job when I came on board at the museum was to work with these artifacts. And I saw so many connections between how spaceflight was being imagined and how spaceflight was actually being executed, how, what was really happening in the real thing. And my new book is the result of the extensive research that I was doing to try to connect all of those dots. So I thought that what I would do this evening is talk to you a little bit about some of the stories that I tell in Space Craze, which is a history of Americans enduring cultural fascination with spaceflight. And as I've said, it's based in the collections at the National Air and Space Museum. And I often think that when people encounter a curator, when there's a curator in your TV show or in your movie, that person knows all of the things. They can rattle off facts. And we know a lot of facts. But the real thing that we're very, very good at is asking questions. And that really is where I started this whole project, which is looking through this collection. And I understand the mission patches and I understand the commemorative medallions. But I also have things like this collection of colorful ray gun toys. Um, there was a time in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s when play guns would have been a regular part of any toy chest. Um, Western six shooters, uh, guns for playing cops and robbers, gangster Tommy guns, and ray guns. This collection that you're looking at has a 1950s Flash Gordon gun in the front. The one on the far right is a Buck Rogers gun from the mid-1930s. That's actually a water pistol with a leather holster on the inside that um, a leather sack that holds the water in that yellow and red one. The space jet in the back is a Japanese made, I believe Taiwan made uh, gun. And the one next to it is also an Asian made gun, which is a laser gun. I don't know if you can see that. So incorporating kind of the latest, um, newest technology invented in 1960 in these imaginative um, space gun. So, Lots of different colors, shapes, um, but really immediately identifiable as a ray gun. And that really got me thinking, why then would you have ray guns as a part of your space play? Because honestly, they're everywhere when you start to really look at them. You've got um, phasers and blasters coming from um, Star Trek and Star Wars. In this case, we have Buck Rogers as played by Buster Crabbe on the left from the movie serials uh, in the 1930s and as depicted on the cover of this big little book. And in both images, which are really not atypical, the main character has a handgun, a space pistol. And at some level that makes no sense, right? Even early, early on people I think understood by the 1930s that these kinds of vehicles, you can see all of the rivets in the imagined spaceship would need to be a pressurized vehicle, much like an aircraft uh, was beginning to be a pressurized vehicle. So having a weapon that shoots a projectile um, in that environment or in the kind of vast distances of space at some level is a bit counterintuitive. And I think it's really a part of the fundamental form of American space science fiction that many people, many scholars have noticed, but I don't know that they've fully explored or pulled apart in the way that you can when you start with objects, when you start with artifacts. So part of my argument is that American space science fiction borrows a lot from the American Western. And so I thought what we would do is just a very brief uh, sidetrack here where we're going to talk about the Westerns as a genre and why that is important for American national identity. So if you'll indulge me, we're going to do a little three slide detour into a uh, flashback to some American studies, American history class that you had. Because it really comes from this very idea of what the American experiment would be, this idea of American exceptionalism, American uniqueness, and that the United States 
as this new nation could escape these old world problems because of available land. So the inheritance laws, which said that everything had to go to the first son, primogenitor, and that everything had to stay together, entail, which was intended to keep land parcels large enough to be actually productive as agrarian land. That was a real limitation on economic opportunity in a place with limited land. So someone, Thomas Jefferson, the third president, purchases this large swath of land in 1803 from France. And he is really thinking that Americans, because they are destined divinely, the idea of manifest destiny to fill that continent would have the space for this empire for liberty. Jefferson thought that by purchasing this much land, he would it would take a hundred generations for Americans to fill the West. And in doing so, they would have really ensured American democracy and economic prosperity for the kinds of people who they expected to be landowners at the time. Now, the trick is by the 1890 census, which is not quite a hundred generations from 1803, the frontier is declared closed. There is no more unexplored unsettled land in the contiguous United States, which was all of the United States in 1893. So we have this historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, who some of you may have heard of, who makes an argument about this, is really puzzled by what is this gonna mean for American national identity, because he argues that the frontier has been really significant in the forging of American national identity, that that idea of winning the wilderness is really integral to the dynamic that shapes American national culture. That meeting of the wilderness and civilization makes American citizens hardy enough to beat back to civilize the wilderness and that they then themselves are shaped by the fortifying experience of that encounter on the frontier. Um, and that really begins to shape an idea about Americans as explorers, as adventurers, as inventive, as persistent, as heading out into new areas. And I will note um, Frederick Jackson Turner, as uh, Thomas Jefferson did, have a bit of a blind spot about this land being open or unoccupied uh, in ways that it never really was. And what it was, was almost very quickly on the closing of that frontier, On the, it begins to be mythologized. So you've got the Westerns that are come up as a quintessentially American genre. So this book, The Virginian from 1902 by Owen Wister, it's not the very first Western, but it's the first cowboy novel with the cowboy as the literary hero. And it really sets some conventions for how the Western is going to play out, whether it's literary or movies or eventually television. And it is the idea of this frontier being in the frontier with this core cast is so fundamental. So we're going to come back now to space science fiction, uh, where I left you with Buck Rogers. And here is a movie poster on the right hand side um, for the movie serials for which you saw the still. If you went to the movies in the 1930s, in the 1950s, to one of these large movie palaces, you would have a first feature, a second feature, a cartoon, a newsreel, and a movie serial, which would have been a chopped up piece of film, you get to see a bit of the adventure. And the idea is it ends on a cliffhanger and you want to come back and see the next thing the next week. So you would pay your quarter and you could go in and just watch all afternoon and it would be just running on a loop and you would see what you saw, stay for the whole thing twice, leave in the middle, do it how you want. But the idea of the these movie serials was that that would be part of what would draw you back to the movies the next week. And when you compare things like Gary Cooper's The Virginian from 1929 with this advertisement for the Buck Rogers film serials uh, from 1939, what you see is some real commonalities in how these toys, how these stories get constructed. There are some really core elements, a core cast, our hero, often blonde, very independent, uh, white-hatted, um, who is working with a sidekick who is often youthful, has an older advisor who's either a scientist or some sort of a doctor. So you think of Mr. Spock, think of Doc Holliday. A love interest with a lot of moxie. So a woman as a part of this core troop um, who is part of the adventure, but has a disturbing tendency to get captured and need rescuing. And they are all then on board a named ship 
in the Western, it would have been a named steed. We know not only Roy Rogers, but Trigger, his horse. In the space adventures, we know the Star Trek Starship Enterprise or the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars as uh, almost a character in the story itself with a name and a personality. And then they are heading off for adventure at the point of a gun. And part of this really crystallized for me. I think it's so everywhere that we don't even think about it. But I was reading a piece from a colleague about Korean science fiction, which is really about Koreans in a future Korea still very much tied to the land and the culture of community of being in a place. And I thought the first thing Americans do is hop aboard a ship and head off um, to some space-based place for an adventure at the point of a gun. And I think that's really something that um, gets created. It's something I call in the book, the Buck Rogers archetype. It gets imitated by Flash Gordon, which is created just a few years later in 1934 with essentially the same kind of a cast um, and not the Mongol hordes, but Ming the Merciless as the enemy there and is starts to create and shape this way that we tell ourselves these stories in a space-based place so that it's a little defamiliarized, it's a little distanced, and we can then have a fresher look at some of the issues and the storylines that are being told. But at the center of these then are these toy ray guns. And so we have in the back upper right, the XZ-31 rocket pistol toy, which is the fir first Buck Rogers toy gun. And in front then, um, the Wilma Deering gun, so the smaller women's gun, and behind a kind of prototype that had been developed that we have in the collection. But really got me thinking when I was looking at these toys about who are you when you play with these toys? Who are you not? Um, there are no toy guns made in the 1930s for Ming the Merciless or for the Mongol hordes. The assumption is that the child is going to assume that they are the hero, that perhaps they need a slightly smaller gun in order to pretend that they are the female lead, but every child should be able to step into the gaze of that lead character. Now, can you play against type? Can you take a toy and do something different with it? Of course you can. Uh, but there's a way in which, and there's a scholar, uh, Robin Bernstein, who's at Harvard, who started writing about the ways that things can embody a sense of how you act with them. And they have a bit of a script to them, much like a play where you might um, take those words and interpret them in your own way. But there is still a sense in the thing of how you would hold it, how you would play with it. It's very unlikely that you're going to wrap this in a blanket and pretend it's a baby doll you grab this kind of a toy and you are now looking down the barrel of a gun as the hero. And so one of the things I do throughout the book is look at objects for what they tell us about their context and about their use through these kinds of embedded close readings. So I thought what I would do for the next couple of minutes is walk you through some of those from some other examples in the book, looking at both space science fiction and at actual space flight. So how do we see this Buck Rogers archetype in, say, the 1950s and early television? So Space Patrol is one of the early television programs. It was initially a live broadcast out of Los Angeles. It was a local program that then became a national program. And if you will follow me in looking at our core cast in the upper right-hand corner, we have in the peaked hat, the center here, Buzz Corey, who is our hero. Uh, next to him with the broad smile is Cadet Happy, his youthful sidekick. On the other side is Security Chief Robbie Robertson, his avuncular advisor. In front uh, in the blonde is uh, Carol Carlisle, who is the love interest, uh, who goes on some of the adventures, but is also occasionally captured. And then on the left here, we have Nina Barra as Tonga, the single named uh, character. And we know that she is now a friendly member of this crew, but she started as an alien. And one of the ways that that's signified is that she's a brunette. So even those subtle bits of physical difference are used to create the alien, to set that distance between who we are and what that other is. And I think that's a part of this fundamental story that gets told through these kinds of shows and kinds of toys uh, is an idea about who can do the exploring. And we see that changing over time. And that is part of what I thought was really fascinating when I started to dig into this material. 
Now I'll tell a brief story on the side here. This play set that you see set up uh, came from Michael O'Hara. He is a collector who is generous donation to the Smithsonian of almost 2000 pieces was part of what created the core of the social and cultural history collection that I get to work with. This is a set that he really debated giving to the Smithsonian, and that is because this isn't something he collected as a collector. This was his set when he was a child. And I think the completeness of it speaks to the way that he was a born collector. Um, but these kinds of play sets, I think, are really fundamental to looking at this 1950s context. And I use some of them to open the chapter about the 1950s. So this, for instance, is a superior spaceport set. You set up the little lithographed um, fence around and the building on the inside and the little plastic aliens and astronauts. And this, in many ways, is a repackaged Western fort. In fact, it's a literally it's a repackaged Western fort. They also sold very much the same set with a lithographed fence that went around that looked like logs and looked like a Western outpost. And with that, you would have had plastic cowboys and Indians. So my colleagues at the National Museum of the American Indian have talked and written very powerfully about how damaging it is to grow up in a culture where your people, your culture are literally the little plastic other that people fight against. That kind of everyday racism was a part of how these sets were put together. There were similar sets that had pith helmeted explorers and bug eyed African natives, but they also had the blue and the gray in Civil War sets. These sets really are, I think, important in a couple of ways. They reflect that Cold War mindset, us versus them, some sense of uh, pervasive cultural interest in invasion from without, uh, subversion from within, and how one might negotiate that. And the other thing that I really started thinking about is looking at this set, and there's the manufacturing history of how toys are made. There's the kind of anthropological stories of how important play is. And then I was really trying to put those together. And one of the things that made a big difference in my interpretation was being a parent. And so I was looking at this and thinking a toy with this many pieces really speaks to having a household environment where the child has their own room or you have a playroom. This is a kind of a toy that doesn't make sense in an apartment. It makes sense in the single family homes that were being built in the suburbs in the 1950s. And that has these, I think, material connections to the baby boom, to white flight, to the way that a toy like this is frankly annoying, unless you have a place where you can take the time to set it up, really get into the play and get to walk away from it and come back and leave it set up without it bothering the entire rest of the family. So I think there are ways in which these objects, as they tell us how they would be played with, also tell us something about the context in which they make sense. So I've talked a bit about the race depictions, um, and I will just briefly include this slide, which is One Worlds Collide, the 1951 uh, George Powell movie. Um, he was the producer, Chesley Bonestell was uh, the famous space artist, was one of the technical advisors. Um, and okay, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the end of the movie, and I'm showing you one of the scenes from the end of the movie, but you've had since 1951 to get a chance to take a look at this. And this is a movie that is about the Earth being destroyed and the space arcs that are needed to carry people away to kind of create uh, a new human population on another passing planet. And I think when you look at the casting of who gets to be a part of this repopulating of the human race, the homogeneity is striking, right? Boy, girl, boy, girl, dressed alike, um, with the exception of the, the one kid and the dog who's in the little carrier. Um, this is the vision of who is going to be heading into the future. Now, space science fiction isn't particularly any more predictive about the future than any other genre, but there's a sense that you're looking at a kind of futuristic vision, and it often gets layered with that sense of it as reflective, not only of its time, but of what things perhaps should be like. 
the racial casting of this film is not remarkable at the time. In the 1951, filmmaking, movie watching, television uh, were largely segregated in how they were produced um, and in what the expectations would have been. But it sets some expectations for the genre and it also then sets the expectations in the audience. And it's part of why Gene Roddenberry's vision of a crew of men and women of different races and a half alien in the Mr. Spock uh, character in the right in the blue shirt, working together on the bridge of a starship, why that looks so radical when this comes to the air and NBC in 1966 and Star Trek um, becomes something on television. So this is in the midst of the women's movement, in the midst of the civil rights movement. We have this vision of, again, much like Buck Rogers, what the very uh, future would look like. This vision of integration of internationalism with the Pavel Chekhov character in the green second from the left uh, played by Walter Koenig. We've got this vision that we've overcome the civil war, this, uh, the cold war, excuse me, that we have overcome our racial differences, that we have men and women working professionally together. And that is supposed to signal the future, but it also becomes an important symbol of what things could be. So I've talked a lot about space science fiction and I wanna make sure that I get to some actual space flight because the same contexts that are shaping what's possible in the entertainment world are also shaping what's possible in how space flight is actually getting put together and how it's getting executed. And those flights begin with Sputnik in 1957 and then very quickly turn to human space flights. And this then, is the group that NASA recruits in 1959 out of military trained jet test pilots. And they are an extraordinary group of gentlemen, but I think you can see in the context of the history that I've been giving you how homogenous this group is. This is a group of cis heterosexual Christian married white men with extraordinary piloting skills great political savvy, um, great talent. And that uniformity in their presentation would have been seen in the 1950s as a sign of their selectedness, of their quality. But even they realized that that was a rather uniform looking group. And in this picture, if you look closely, you can notice that they have lined up in alphabetical order so that the newspapers will get the captions right because they look quite so similar that often they were misidentified. So from left to right, we have Carpenter, Cooper, Glenn, Grissom, Shara, Shepard, and Slayton. And that vision of who would do the exploring, who would stand in, who, as Tom Wolfe said in his novel that then becomes that famous movie, who has the right stuff to be able to stand in as that single person combatant for the nation in this Cold War battlefield of the space race, I think is really very much reflective of the time at the time, but it's something that we also see really changing over time. So there's obviously a lot more in the book about the 1960s. I'm skipping here to the late 1970s in order to make sure that we have a chance to have a good discussion. And in the 1970s chapter, I'm really looking at the ways that the civil rights movement and the women's movement have made such changes, and NASA is responding to that. NASA is a part of that. The people, culture isn't some magic mirror um, to its social condition because it's inventive in that way. It's because the people who are doing the doing are neck deep in it. They are a part of the culture too, and they are a part of these changes. So they are making those happen as well. So this is the uh, group of 35 new guys, the astronaut candidates selected in January of 1978 to be a part of the space shuttle program. I will point out to you that this is the most diverse group that NASA brought in to that date. This was the first time there were folks in this group who um, were not only white men. It includes six women, three African-American men, and one Asian-American man. So starting from the top left in the first row, we have Guy Bluford, who becomes the first African-American in space. On the second row from the left, you have uh, Dr. Anna Fisher, 
And then in the middle picture, Fred Gregory, uh, one of the first three African-American men admitted to the astronaut corps. Um, in the middle row, you have both Shannon Lucid and then Ron McNair. On the fourth row, you see Ellison Onizuka, Asian-American man from Hawaii, next to Judy Resnick, and then Sally Ride, and then Dr. Ray Seddon. And finally, on the bottom row, we have Dr. Kathy Sullivan, who eventually becomes uh, the first American woman to do a spacewalk. Now, this doesn't just happen. As I've said, NASA is a part of this, but NASA was also was dealing with a legacy of past discrimination. Talented people with PhDs and research degrees didn't necessarily think that the space program had a space for them. Nobody like them had ever been admitted to the astronaut corps. And so it's actually something that NASA has to go and recruit. And so we see here, Nichelle Nichols, the actor who played Lieutenant Uhura in Star Trek, that television show from the late 1960s. And she had become a big fan of what NASA was doing because NASA was sending representatives to Star Trek fan conventions beginning in the early 1970s. And she was getting very excited, not only about this vision of what could be, but about what was really being planned for the space shuttle program. And so NASA administrator, James Fletcher actually hired her to do a public relations campaign to try to recruit a more diverse group of astronaut candidates. And so we see here a uh, somewhat grainy still from one of the films that she made. That's her with Apollo astronaut Alan Bean um, testing out some equipment and in the persona of herself as Michelle Nichols, but also as Lieutenant Uhura, that African-American uh, communications officer who was a part of the Starship Enterprise crew, she was making the case to people that they should consider bringing their talents to the astronaut program. And in fact, uh, people like Dr. Mae Jamison, who becomes the first African-American uh, woman in space, directly credits Nichelle Nichols with her decision to apply to the astronaut corps. Now, as we look at the 1970s, on the one hand, we have the birth of the space shuttle program. And on the other hand, we have a fundamental change in space science fiction. And this comes from Star Wars, which was originally released A New Hope. The first movie, number four, was released in 1977. So I will tell just a couple of Star Wars stories before I begin to wrap up. So by the late 1970s, space science fiction is considered a bit of a dead genre for film or even TV until Star Wars in 1977. It's a game changer in multiple ways. First of all, merchandise like these action figures uh, for Empire Strikes Back, the second in the first trilogy, the second film in that first trilogy of films. Toys usually weren't made for movies. They came and went at the theaters too quickly to be merchandised in this way. You might create toys around a radio program or a television program, something that was seen as having longer duration. Um, but George Lucas really knew what he had. He was excited about it. Uh, people in the end, this Star Wars is one of the first what we call blockbuster movies in the late 1970s. That becomes a term. People are going to see Star Wars multiple times in the theaters. And these kinds of action figures, which are innovated by Kenner, a Cincinnati company, a small toy company, the big toy companies passed on the chance to do this because, as I said, nobody really merchandised for movies created these three and a three quarter inch action figures that would fit in your hand and then allow you to play with the say Millennium Falcon playset, which you could then manipulate these. So who are you when you play with these kinds of toys? Um, this was something that was advertised and that was written a lot about as it appealed to both boys and girls. You're playing with human characters, you're playing with droids, you're playing with aliens. So there's a sense that you can be embodying lots of different viewpoints. And I think that fits very much with the social and cultural environment you're getting by the late 1970s, where there's not quite as much of a sense of that's an other over there, but um, more integrated sense of people's daily lives. And then I'll, the last piece I'll point out on this is this carrying case the carrying case and the card backs are encouragement to then collect multiple toys. So a carrying case like this, if any of you had it, I know we had them in my house, they have little labels that go into the different shaped containers on the inside, the little um, 
places where you can put the action figure. There's a short one for Yoda. There's a short one for R2-D2. There's a taller one for Chewbacca. And those have labels in them. So you know, as a kid, you want to be able to have all of the right things to be able to fill them in. And so that kind of collecting becomes very uh, collectible in terms of play in the 1970s and 1980s, and then collectible as a resale and a collectible item farther in. And so that's one of the things that I'm tracing through Space Craze is the ways that people are excited about space flight, both real space flight with the birth of the space shuttle program, but also then these new visions which are changing to reflect the society that is producing them. So I'm gonna to skip to the end. Smithsonian Books encouraged me to include a new chapter that brought this story really all the way up to the present. And the very last paragraphs were being written um, the day before the manuscript was due. And this is one of the properties that I was writing about. So this is uh, the, from Halo. Halo began in 2001 as a video game released on the Microsoft Xbox console system. And there's been a whole series of games, and this is something that a popular culture scholar like myself would call transmedia storytelling, which is essentially a coherent story told over many different kinds of media. So starting with the uh, video game built into Halo 2 and Halo 3, but then also it has developed into um, comic books and other forms. There have been some television shows. There was just a brief um, one season television show. I think we're waiting to see if it will be uh, continued. But this helmet was created so that someone could dress up as the main character who is Master Chief. This is a story about uh, 26th century super soldiers in a space environment called Spartan. They're called Spartans and they're wearing these armored spacesuits. And notably, that visor that's on the helmet. This was created so someone could dress up as this character and say, take it to a charity event. Um, but Master Chief, until the television show, is always the character that you embody, one of the characters that you embody, but in the original show, it's uh, the original video game, it's the main character you embody. And as a result, Master Chief can be anyone. You, anyone can be Master Chief. And what we see reflected on this visor, this mirrored visor is just the space environment in which you find yourself in this first person shooter in the first person. So I think it's an interesting way in which um, we see, I put, love putting that kind of next to those ray guns that really started us uh, with this investigation with Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon from the 1930s. So the book runs right up to January of 2022, and that allowed me to include the commercial space flights of 2021, SpaceX's Inspiration4 mission aboard the Crew Dragon, Virgin Galactic suborbital flights, Blue Origin suborbital tourism. There have been six flights up to date with up to 32 people. And the connections then between space science fiction and actual space execution are even stronger when you really start to dig into the recent years. So on the left here, we have the New Shepard um, from, um, no, sorry, on the left, we're looking at a SpaceX Falcon. This is uh, the Falcon 9, and th that Falcon takes its name from the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. On the right, you're looking at the New Shepard vehicle, the New Shepard and New Glenn vehicles from Jeff Bezos's um, Blue Origin take their names from Alan Shepard and John Glenn, those two early American astronauts. So the execution of actual spaceflight right now is very tied into these memories of how spaceflight had been imagined and executed in those early years. And so I was able to take that story up through things like Halo and The Expanse, the new Star Trek series, the new Star Wars movies and series, and just look at the ways that there are still these powerful connections. And that when you look at how spaceflight has been imagined and about how it has been carried out and why that excitement has ebbed and flowed, I think we can argue that it has been persistent and resurgent because it taps into these core ideas about American identity and because it has been so malleable and reflective of the societies that are producing them. And it's just been awfully fun to dig into and put together as the book 
and to then get to bring to an audience like you tonight. So I thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Uh, again, I'm asking all of the participants to put their questions in the chat. Um, I This was a, an amazing lecture. Thank you so much, Margaret. I, as someone who grew up watching Star Wars, um, I, you know, I was totally engrossed by everything that you said. So also as a, a curator and a museum director, um, I want to know, is there a catalog or website where people can see all the works that are in the space, um, the space and history department collections? Yes, so we work hard to put our collections online, um, and we also have a strong web presence for our exhibits. So the collections are the individual pieces, and you can dig into the, if you go to air and space, all one thing, uh, dot si dot um, edu, we're an educational institution, so it's an edu, not a dot com. Uh, you can dig into the collection and really learn a lot. And also then we keep things, I've got the catalog behind me from The Magic of Myth, which is a 1990s era um, Star Wars exhibit that was very popular. And the 1990s era website for that still exists host by our, hosted by our website. So it is um, not a example of modern clean web design, but it is an example of great exploration of this content. And we have that for our websites about the Apollo program, about early human space flight, about the um, exhibits that we're working on now about our satellite enabled world. So yes, please come uh, visit us. If you're a teacher, please come look at our uh, educational sites. We have lots of resources for classrooms for museums to use for themselves. So um, yes, we're working very hard to make sure that we're not only doing the things here in Washington DC, but bringing them to the world, whether it's through a webinar like this or through our website. Wonderful. Um, how are works actually chosen? So if someone wants to donate something, does does the Lego company donate all of their space material? Um, does how, how does that all come about? That's a great question. Um, for things like stuff from an airline or stuff from NASA, we work with the airline or we work with NASA to bring things over. Um, but then we also often are sometimes working with individual astronauts to bring things into the collection. Most of the social and cultural and memorabilia really comes um, from individual donors. And so that is something where someone might write to me and say, you know, I have something I'd be interested in giving it to the museum and I'll start a correspondence with them about what does it look like? How good of the condition is it? Can you tell me something about the story? Um, I tell the story in the book about a 1960s cookie jar. I'd seen better examples, but the one that I got came from a family that really loved space flight, was excited about it and saw this cookie jar as an example of that. And that's the story that I then wanted to capture. Um, I will say that the curators make the decisions about what we should be bringing in. If we're good at our job, we say no a lot more than we say yes, so that we're discerning in what we bring in, because then we really are in the forever business at the Smithsonian. And so if we bring something into the collection, we want to be able to dedicate the resources to it to take good care of it. And in addition to being a wildly popular museum, we are really in our core an object library. We should have collected the right things to tell the story of aviation and space flight for generations. And that's the responsibility that we think about as curators when we're making those choices. Wonderful. Another question is, uh, why don't you think there's been a new franchises beyond, beyond Star Trek and Star Wars developed more recently? Great question. Um, I think there have, you know, you see these things like The Expanse, uh, which is something that um, was really invented kind of deliberately by uh, two gentlemen who were initially writing for a video game and then decided that the universe they had created became so rich that it was created, became a television show on sci-fi, and then it was eventually picked up by um, Amazon uh, television and finished there. One of the major reasons, the major rationale, the explanation behind a lot of things about why was this this way is it's show business. 
And it's about where the business model is, why there is so much kitty space science fiction in the 1950s versus why you get these kind of very gritty movies in the 1970s that are more dystopian than utopian. The answer as you get into this streaming era is that it's a proven way of going back to a known audience. So there's a great temptation to create more of things that we know that people already like, Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, to revive those kinds of franchises and to extend those universes in ways that are gonna capture a known audience. But you also get things like For All Mankind on um, Apple Plus where they are reimagining the space age with kind of great accuracy. We've actually consulted for them. Um, they've asked us about getting some details of the spacecraft right. So they're really working with a great detailed history of the actual events and the actual vehicles and then jumping off into their imagined version of that history. But you're right, there are more reboots and retreads than there are new produ productions right now. And that in many ways is because the kinds of money that rides on this, they want it to be a sure bet and they would like to go to an established audience. Sure. Um, how does 2001 A Space Odyssey fit into it? I think we all um, you know, were fascinated when that movie came out and I think it still holds so much. And each time I know I watch it, I see more and more. How do you think it fits in? It's a really powerful vision. It comes in a moment where it's really more speculative fiction than it is science fiction, right? They're looking at what would be realistic. What are things that they're hoping would be true in the next 50 or 100 years that you would be taking a shuttle back and forth to an orbiting space station around the moon and then from there on to the moon. Um, we have the Artemis II astronauts who are preparing for a circumlunar flight in the next couple of years. They are going to be heading to NASA wants to build an orbiting space station around the moon called Gateway that is going to be a way station to a more permanent occupation of the moon. So I think that the power of that really comes out of that uh, vision being very accurately based in what was known at the time about what could be realistic and then adding that wonderful uh, cinematic polish to it. I love this next question. First cowboys, then spacemen. What is next? AI? <laughs> I think so. And I think that there are ways in which, you know, science fiction often is a way that we play with ideas about what makes us nervous. Um, so we have things like, um, to jump out of space science fiction for a second, the fast example is Spider-Man, right? Spider-Man used to be bitten by a radioactive spider when people were really worried about nuclear arms and nuclear power. And now the new version of Spider-Man was bitten by a genetically engineered spider. So we find ways to work into our fiction, the things that we're a little bit nervous about. So things like um, an inability to figure out what's real and what's robotic uh, or what's AI or whether our AI might turn on us is something that then we kind of work out by writing those stories and um, defamiliarizing it, setting it in that space setting. Another question, uh, is Star Wars the first space adventure not to have someone from Earth? Ooh. Good question. That is a great question. Um, Wow, I don't know. I've not been asked that. Um, it may well be. I'm trying to think back. Um, I've written about the depiction of faster than light travel, and that often, you know, in say Dan Dare, originated with some alien. And then it's um, really not until you get to something like Forbidden Planet is the first depiction of a kind of human created space vehicle that can go faster than the speed of light. Um, I don't know, and that's a really interesting distinction about the Star Wars universe, because you're right, it does not have Earth as a part of its imaginary uh, in the way that you know Star Trek starts from Starfleet and has Earth as a major part of it, or the Expanse has Earth and Moon and Mars, as well as the belt and the outer planets um, as a part of it. So we haven't, it's a universe that does not imagine us particularly as a part of it. That's really interesting. All right, now I have something. I always end up with something I have to go look up. <laughs> That's great. Um, are not the classic sci-fi novels novels considered popular culture because not on TV or comics or, or in theaters? Bradbury, Asimov, Wells, Verne. 
Great question. And the short answer is that I deal with that in the book because I start with objects. I tend to work more with television, movies, radio, other forms of popular culture, because there aren't a lot of three-dimensional objects that are created out of literary science fiction. So the you know uh, line in the book is that you know think about how few Isaac Asimov action figures you've seen, um, and so you don't necessarily get merchandise until you tend to have it in a different kind of a form, a radio program, a television program, a movie. Um, and so that is a definite way that this book is kind of skewed. And there's a whole other set of books that could be written based on really looking and digging into literary science fiction. Because you can do a lot with the theater of the mind with a book that um, is hard to do on a television screen or very expensive to do in a movie. Um, this one, I'm not quite sure. Um, the Murder Bot series is Teenage AI fun book. So I guess it's just a comment. <laughs> okay. I always love that when you, there are suggestions for the, uh, for folks who are watching and for me of new things that we could go look for. So thank you for that. Okay. And then it says, um, next question, aliens can't get here because of distances, yet we love the idea of visitations. Why? I think because the alien figure allows us to take things that we are grappling with and put them in this kind of arm's length of, of the other. And so we find all kinds of different physicalities. Um, aliens are often racialized. Aliens are often gendered. Um, aliens sometimes kind of stand in for the Soviets uh, in a Cold War context. They ask us to confront the who is not us and by doing that to understand more about who we think our tribe is, who is the us. And um, so I think we've been fascinated with aliens as um, a literary figure, as a pop culture figure. Um, there's a whole set of uh, books that have been written about the fascination with alien visitation. I've got a colleague who's working on that as a historian of medicine. What is the psychology of um, alien encounters um, and how can you understand that as a historian of uh, psychology? So I just think that there are rich place on which we can project all kinds of things and then cope with that in a way that we can make sense of. Uh, I just also wanted to put it, put a word in. Um, my daughter had done an internship when she was between um, uh, high school and college um, at NASA in Washington D.C., and she worked under Administrator Bolden, who was one of the first, I believe, the first African American uh, to head NASA. And he was extraordinary. He was one of the one of that early crew of um, Black Af African American um, uh, astronauts that were recruited into the into, into um, getting into the core. Um, yes. But she also met some wonderful people. This one young man, I remember he was from MIT and he was just brilliant. He had applied five times um, and he had everything going for him. And yet he still never made it. Uh, I believe he's working for Jeff Bezos right now. So he's still involved with space, but he had always wanted to be. So it's a very difficult. I think it's the cream of the cream of the cream of the cream uh, who get to be in that particular situation. So um, hats off to everybody. I think that's quite amazing. Uh, my question again, have you reached out to Jeff Bezos and people like that to donate materials to to you? We are working with all kinds of people. Um, Jeff Bezos has been very generous to the National Air and Space Museum, gave a, a very generous gift that is being used to fund the Bezos Learning Center, which is going to expand our classroom space and our ability to really um, think creatively about how we bring the lessons that we have at the museum beyond the walls of the museum. Um, but we're continually thinking about new places where we can be reaching out to people and trying to figure out how to build the collection, both for exhibits and also for that core research purpose of being the object library for the nation and the world. Wonderful. Great. Um, well, I, I'm so amazed um, that the uh, wonderful questions that we had going forward. And I think this conversation could go on so much longer because it's really, it's just, it's just, it's, it, it's enhanced our lives so much. Um, my last question to you, because I have a lot of questions here. <laughs> I'm fascinated. Um, I know a lot of artists who've, um, who've created artwork um, mm -hmm. that, um, that they, I have one, actually, I'm sitting in my daughter's room right now, and she has a piece that was donated to NASA, but it was donated to, I guess, to a different section than 
then um, I don't know. I don't know what section it would like. It's a print. Uh, mm. that was made. I know one print was donated. It must be to the main category. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm trying to guess because I know that like Roy Lichtenstein, who was a noted artist, was very much inspired by, you know, science fiction and did a whole series of pa uh, paintings and prints that had that. Are those are in the main collection of the Smithsonian as opposed to, I guess, to the art collection as opposed to so being? We have art as a part of the National Air and Space Museum's collection. We actually have more art in more fine art in the museum's collection than the Hirshhorn next door, which is our modern art museum within the Smithsonian. Um, art is actually part of the National Air and Space Museum's charter written into our legislation. So NASA hired artists in the, as a part of the NASA art program in order to publicize what they were doing very early 1963 and has had a continuing relationship with putting that material out. Some of that, a lot of that has come to the National Air and Space Museum, but I think it's also a place where um, those kinds of artistic visions um, have sometimes been kind of very right down the middle, people working with NASA in order to create paintings and sculptures and sketchbooks. And it's also been something that I write in the book about Afrofuturism, about things like Sun Ra or George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic and their uh, mothership and the ways that uh, African-Americans have used space imaginary as a way to imagine a future that is outside of the social strictures that uh, existed at times in the past and in the current day. So I've got a colleague who's also doing a, an oral history project on Latino futurism, uh, which is an active part of the art, Latino art scene. And so we're really looking in many different ways here at the museum um, and across the Smithsonian. There's a new Afrofuturism exhibit that just did, opened at the National Museum of African American History and Culture down the mall um, in the Smithsonian. So art, I think, is a particularly rich way of exploring these same sets of ideas. And I touch on that in the book, but because I stick, I'm starting with objects, I tend to um, stick with that. And the trick with any sort of presentation like this is I feel like the lots of great questions about what about this kind of thing or what about that kind of thing, it could fit the analysis. And I hope that getting a chance to hear about the book or even a chance to read about the book gets you looking at lots of different things in new ways. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think um, the Southampton Art Center and the Hamptons Observatory really want to extend our deepest thanks to you uh, for taking the time and to educate us. I want to thank Joe uh, Diamond from the Southampton Art Center for organizing um, this Zoom uh, presentation. I want to thank Donna. Uh, Donna McCormick uh, from the Hamptons Observatory for uh, partnering with us and being so wonderful and bringing science to the East End and sharing it uh, with all, all, all the, everyone, uh, schools, individual institutions, just is really out there. Please bring us more astronauts, Donna. We love that. <laughs> and, and, and we have to have a field trip to the Smithsonian to, to, to meet you and to see the wonderful collection that you have there. Thank you that so much. Thank you very much.